used to attend uh, the chapel back in the day. Uh, when he was at Dallas Seminary, he went on to Westminster, and he serves today as president of Westminster Theological Seminary. He's also a professor of historical theology there. Uh, he has as a passion uh, the faith of our founding fathers, and you know many of you have the book that he wrote on George Washington's Sacred Fire in your library. Uh, he's a, an author of several books besides that. The most recent one, St. Peter's Principles, which I have, thanks to Mike Black, and uh, really a very clever, good book on uh, leadership principles. And so we're very glad to have uh, Peter here. He also serves as president of the Providence Forum, an organization dedicated to preserving and defending the Judeo-Christian values of our nation's founding fathers. Most of all for us, he's a friend of Believer's Chapel. So uh, Dr. Lilback, please come and read the scripture passage for this morning. Well, the book called St. Peter's Principles, its subtitle is Leadership for Those Who Already Know Their Incompetence. And, and so I, I want you to know why I feel competent to write such a book. I resemble that remark. So uh, it's a great pleasure to be back with you today. And as we prepare to study God's Word, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I want to put it in the context of chapter 11, verses 39 and 40. And we'll start there in a moment. But let's remember uh, the book of Hebrews is one of those uh, extraordinary uh, contributions to the truths of Jesus Christ. When you master the book of Hebrews, you've learned how to put the whole Bible together, Old and New Testament. Uh, I have talked about the book of Hebrews sometimes, and people say, oh, it's so good you're preaching from the Old Testament. And that's always a good hint. They don't know much about the Bible, right? But they're on to something. This book of, to the Hebrews was really trying to bring the whole Old Testament revelation to bear uh, on its climax in Jesus Christ. Uh, a couple words that summarize the, the epistle to Hebrews is Jesus is better. He is the one who makes what God had done in the Old Testament come to its real fruition, its climax. This book wants us to look to Jesus. And uh, it tells us right from the beginning that God has spoken in many different ways. But in these last days, he's spoken in Son, in the Son of God. And so we're now hearing after a long discussion in chapter 11 of what we can call the hall of fame of faith, the great uh, believers who have trusted the Lord and believed his word throughout redemptive history. We now come to the point where we join in, in the great race of faith. And my message today is entitled, The Great Race of Faith in the Stadium of the Saints. Please hear the reading of God's word, beginning at verse 39 of chapter 11 of Hebrews. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Would you join me as we pray together? Heavenly Father, as we come before you this day, we realize that we are a needy people. Uh, we are living in a culture that is turning its back rapidly on the great treasures of your word that have come through your church as the salt and light of the earth. Lord, in our own lives, we feel the temptation to just become part of the culture and part of its flow. Father, forgive us for our sin, our unbelief, our complacency. Lord, we are a weary people, but your word is like fire in our bones. Your word by your powerful spirit comes into our being, enables us to begin to live a life that pleases you. Lord, help us to lift our gaze only to Jesus Christ 
and to see in him our destiny, our joy, our strength, our all in all. Oh, Lord, as we turn from ourselves and the things that uh, weighed us down in this world, may we see that this momentary world that is so fleeting calls us to a destiny that never ends, that we're united to Christ, that in him, as we see our perfect union and grace, we find true joy that helps us to bear the cross we might be bearing today. Lord, would you help us now to be truly yours? Teach us, for you are the great teacher of your people by your word and spirit. We pray for those many burdens that are part of our lives that we cannot easily set down, for they are loved ones. They are personal afflictions. They are uncertainties, doubts, temptations, and sins. Oh, Lord, would you please give grace to each of us as we think about those whom we love. Lord, if it would be your great purpose, would you heal our loved ones? Would you draw the wanderer back to your flock? Would you help us to have strength to say no to that temptation, to that sin that so easily besets us? Lord, we pray that afresh we would meet with the living God. Lord, you've taught us that when two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. Lord, we're here in your name, so we welcome you. May your presence be such that when we leave, people will say, they have been with Jesus. Lord, would you be our teacher, untutored and as unlearned as we are in ourselves, but with you we have the mind of God. May we see things from your perspective for your glory. And Lord, on a personal note as I conclude my prayer, thank you for this congregation, for its faithful ministry through the years and its fruitful labors that have blessed me so deeply through Dr. Johnson and uh, Pastor Dan and many others who are dear brothers and friends in the gospel. Do you continue to build your church for your glory? Thank you for the joy then of studying your word, worshiping your name. Thank you for giving us a fresh gift of grace. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. It's hard to believe when you look at this old, worn-out figure. I used to play high school football. <laughs> I was pretty good. Not great, but good enough to be all county in my senior year. Can you believe that? I don't think I can even run a 100-yard dash anymore. I can only trot one. You know, so when I played high school football, I was always glad that when I was playing it, while I couldn't see the sea of humanity, it was, uh, football's pretty big in northern Ohio, where I come from, and I always knew my dad was there watching. I couldn't see him, but I knew he was there. And sometimes in the back of my mind, I wonder, who else is in the stands? Could there be a college coach coming to watch and say, maybe, maybe that little back's got some potential? I didn't have that much potential. But you know, you wonder, well, who's out in the crowd? Who's watching? Well, that's what's going on in the passage we're looking at. As we read these verses, starting at verse 1 of Hebrews 12, it says, Therefore, and you're good Bible students, so that means you've got to go back and say what's going on. It's asking us to read a little bit of what preceded. And you notice it says in verse 3, And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had promised something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Well, it's so it's wanting us to connect with those verses that somehow there's a group of people who are believers who did not get all that they longed for because somehow they're dependent on us. And so we got to go back and say, well, who are all these? Well, because you're a good Bible student, you know who all these are. These are the heroes of the Hall of Fame of Faith. And it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, in the stadium that we are running our race of faith in, in the stands, are the following people watching us run. Abel, according to verse 4 of chapter 11. Enoch, according to verse 5. Noah, according to verse 7. Verse 8, Abraham. Isaac and Jacob, verses 9 and 20. Sarah. Verse 11, Joseph, 21 and 22. Moses, verses 23 through 27. Joshua, Rahab, the judges, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, Samuel and the prophets. That means Elijah and Elisha are watching. 
And it further, David, verse 32, these martyrs and warriors, people who've witnessed for the Christ, who are witnessing us as we run the race. Do you realize that you are running the great race of faith in a stadium and the saints of the ages are in the bleachers watching? We're important. Why is this so important to them? Because the race that they've run is not complete till the last one crosses the finish line. Could you imagine a, a baseball season that worked like this? Well, Babe Ruth is the home run champ, and Mantle and Maris have, you know, gone through their home run derby, and we've seen great players like Willie Mays and Hank Aaron and Ty Cobb and uh, Johnny Bench and Pete Rose and Ted Williams and Jackie Robinson, and you add the others. They've all played. There have been all these World Series, but they don't hold yet because it has to be the last game before all of those things are official. Everything is resting on the final one. That's why the crowd is so watching. Uh, Babe Ruth is watching. Who's going to win this year? Is this going to be the game where finally I can be truly the home run king? It's all conditioned on the great race of faith is a relay. One generation of believer after another is passing the baton. And they have not seen the fullness of what God has for them till the last one of God's people crossed the finish line. You know what that means? Your race is important. This is a team sport. This is not just a few greats that are running the race. Every one of us are in this together. You know, I played team sports, and, uh, you know, I remember I never scored a touchdown because I wasn't in a position to do it. But I, you know what? I, I cost a few touchdowns because I did the wrong thing. You, call, you heard of penalties? They call it back. That's very embarrassing in front of that big crowd. Well, the point is, is that these people are watching. They're anxiously waiting because their ultimate destiny is tied into ours. And it's when we have finished it that what they've longed for finally becomes a reality. The therefore is saying, because of this great crowd of saints, these martyrs, these witnesses, people who've looked to the gospel and are watching us, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, they're witnessing and cheering us on, each and every one of us. It's almost as if when we come to Sunday services, the roof opens up and the, the Lord's people are cheering down. So what's happening to those people down there? Are they serious? Are they going to run the race? When we look at the word that it says to be surrounded, it's a fascinating word in the original. It's a, it's a word that is used by Paul of wearing his chain. Think about that. In Acts 28, 20, he says, I wear this chain. It's the same word of being surrounded. This is the kind of crowd that is crushing in on you. They're so interested that it's like a chain that's around you. They're hemming you in. You can think of that image of the Super Bowl when the, the trophy is being lifted up and everybody's crushing in to get close to see it. It's not just they're way out there somewhere. They're kind of barging in. They're watching us in the spiritual. They're surrounding us. The same word is used of, of, of the millstone that's around the person's neck that should be th thrown into the sea because they've done something to harm one of the little ones of Christ. It's that close. We are being crushed in with witnesses. And why is this so important? Well, we've said it because they're counting on us. It's fascinating as we look at it, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Why a cloud? The word in the original here is a word that's different from the normal word for the clouds. Normally, the clouds in the heavens are in the feminine. You know, it's, uh, the clouds are wisps and sometimes they're ma very masculine too, but in the Greek language, they're feminine. This is a, a neuter form. And when it's used this way, it's saying it's not a cloud, but it's like a cloud. I come from uh, Pennsylvania, and, you know, at harvest time, at the end of the season, you know, birds of a feather flock together. Have you ever been in that place where all the birds are suddenly flying together and there's this big black cloud flying around? You realize it's not a cloud, they're just birds. You look at it, it's like just one big sweep. He's saying this cloud is so big that it's like one mass of witnesses that are just surrounding us, a host, not a cloud, ephemeral, but like you look out and you just see a sea of humanity. They're all watching. 
They're surrounding us as tight as clothing, like a chain around you. They're watching what we're doing because they have a vested interest in what we're trying to accomplish. Yes, they are witnesses. They are eyewitnesses. They're like those two or three that come together in a lawsuit. They're like those that heard Timothy's confession. These are people that can testify with their eyes what's happening, what happened in their lives and what's happening in your life. We are not alone. There's great interest by a great crowd in what we are doing. That fascinating thought then comes to you to say, do you realize how significant your Christian life is? You're not extraneous. You're part of the team. You're part of those that need to finish the race. And so if we are part of those that are watching, what must we do? I would say a great interest of a great crowd requires great preparation for us to run the race that's before us. You notice how it puts it here? Verse 1, Therefore, because of this great crowd, since we're surrounded by such a tight, by such a sea of people who are watching us, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. As we look at these words, we see that our preparation is critical. As we get ready to run, it says, let us also lay aside every weight. This is a first-person plural commandment, the let us. The writer of the Hebrews is including himself here. He's not just preaching at us. He's saying, I'm in this too. I need to take this as my own duty. I've got to deal with it in my life. Why? Because it's a team sport. He's running the race too. We're all running this race. Let us together realize what all of us need to do. And what must the first thing do? Well, if we're going to be running a race, the first thing you don't want to do is carry any extra weight, especially if you're running a marathon. You ever notice when you watch a marathon runner as they're running, they don't carry a water bottle with them. They hope someone will come along and let them drink on the edge because that extra 16 ounces of water might slow them down. They run, they run light. They run without a lot of weight. I, I've mentioned I like to hike on my uh, 65th birthday year. I had a chance to go to one of my students who's a professor in northern India, just south of the Himalaya Mountains. And uh, there, there was uh, a peak that he let me climb. He said, we chose it because you're 65 this year. It's called Old Man's Peak. <laughs> Perfectly selected, right? And that's in the Hindi language. So I said, well, what does that mean? He said, Old Man Peak. Okay, I resemble that too. So well, it, too, it was a two-day hike. And when we got, after our first day, we camped out. And then he said, okay, we're going to take the next day and we're going to leave everything behind. That pack that you brought, the tent, the food, just enough to get to the top. You don't want to carry any more than you have to carry because it can be some hard climbing. And so we took the weight and we laid it aside. In the original, the word for weight includes the word haughtiness, pride, self-interest, self-aggrandizement. The writer of the Hebrews says, a lot of saints from the past are surrounding us, watching us as we're getting ready to run our race. And they're looking at us. Are we humble enough to run it? Or is it all about us? And what's our comfort? Or have we said, it's not me. It's not about me. I set aside my, all the weights of my self-interest. Are we running light? I, look at all the things that we have cares for. How important are the things of this world compared to the destiny of what you're trying to achieve for the glory of Christ? What are you weighted down? What are your cares? What is your concern for yourself? He says we need to take those and we need to put them off. It's interesting. It says that every weight should be laid aside. The laying aside is a word that's picked up in various Pauline and New Testament writers. Paul will say in Ephesians 4.25, if you're involved in falsehood, like a, a dirty shirt, take it off and lay it aside. James 1.21 says... Lay aside your filthiness and rampant wickedness. It's like you fall in a mud puddle and your blue jeans are soaked with mud. Take them off. Get it off. 1 Peter 2.1 says, Let us lay aside malice and deceit and hypocrisy, envy and slander. That is, things that have made you messy. I'll never forget 
a very humorous moment when I was with one of my very good donors at the seminary. You know, that's one of the jobs of a president. I can't pass an offering plate anymore. I have to hope that people want to talk to me about the ministry I do and say, would you help support it? We, we live by faith. And so I was with a donor. It was, it was funny. His wife looked at him. He, you know, he's a, a very accomplished attorney. And he had only buttoned one of the buttons on his collar. And she said, honey, I think you ought to button that other button. She was from Virginia, had a very lovely accent. So, so he said, okay. He said, well, Pete, while we're correcting buttons, do you realize you got a stain on yours right there? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So I was laughing. And I stopped laughing instantly. And I went. I, I had made the mistake of wearing the shirt I'd worn the day before. Now, you can get away with that if you carefully check and make sure there aren't any stains on it, right? Maybe and you, and you didn't sweat too much, you know? <laughs> I was very embarrassing. I had to go and try to wash out the stain out of my collar and come back and carry on the conversation. Well, the point is, we are to lay aside what is dirty in our lives. We're getting ready to run a race. Weighty things, staining things, we need to lay them aside. Remember, the writer says, let us. He's doing this. And he goes on and he says, it's not just these weights, but there's the sins which cling so closely to us. The idea is that there's certain kinds of sins that are just so natural, they surround us like quicksand. They surround us like when a boat gets in water, it's around all the whole boat instantly. So there are sins like that in our lives that are so uniquely ours that if we get involved with in them, they just suck us in. And so I thought about this. These are the sins that we're vulnerable to. Cain was vulnerable to anger. Abraham, to fear. To David, to lust. Solomon, to pride. To Peter, impatience. And each of us, if we're honest, there's something that's so easy for us to get sucked into. This passage is saying, let's take away the weighty things that take our attention. We've got a race to run. And let's look at the sins that just swallow us whole, that surround us and be honest about them, and say we need to, by grace, repent, put them away. Say, Lord, equip me to run this race. So we've said thus far that we are surrounded in a stadium of the martyrs, the witnesses of the past. They're cheering us on. They're crowding in us. They're like a great cloud, like a, a flock of birds at harvest time. They're so closely around us that we can feel their presence. And they're here because we're running a race. They're waiting for us to finish because their blessing is not achieved until we complete ours. And this race that we are to run is one that is very serious, that requires us to put aside our pride and weighty things and the sins that keep sucking us in, that try to dominate our lives. And so he says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The point that he's saying here is that our Christian lives are like a run, but they're not like a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a long run. It's going to be tough. There's going to be times where the ground is level. There are going to be other times where it's heartbreak hill. We've got to keep going. We're not finished yet. This idea of running the race. And again, the writer says, let us run. He says, I'm in this with you too. You think about how running comes through the scriptures. You remember, it's the run that the prodigal son's father had when he saw his son far away. He ran to him. It's like Mary running to Peter and John from the empty tomb. It's like John and Peter running to the empty tomb to see that it is empty. Paul says, but don't deny grace so that it doesn't depend upon the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. When we run this race, we're going to see that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He's giving us energy to continue on. We'll talk more about that. Our life is a distant run. Galatians 2, 2. And it was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private. To those who are of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. We are in a run. Galatians 5, 7. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Philippians 2, 16. Holding fast the word of life. So then in the day of Christ I may have cause to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. You're in a long distance run and you're getting ready for it. Here on this Sunday, again, you're saying, Lord, Get rid of that pride in my life. Get rid of those distractions in my life. And Lord, those sins that just surround me like quicksand, help me to get ready. 
because I have a marathon I have to run. It's going to be tough, but I'm going to be running it with the writer of the Hebrews or with other Christians that were in a team sport, and I'm surrounded by a great crowd. And it's interesting, this run that we are to run, it's fascinating. The word in the original is not the word for running just a race. It actually is the word agona, from which we get the word agony. It said, you are getting ready to run a fight. This is going to be like running the gauntlet. You're running, but there are going to be people trying to knock you down. Issues that are going to come in your way to harm you. It is not an easy thing. It's the same word that Paul uses in, in 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight. I have fought the good agony. I have finished the course. Well, that word for course is not the word the writer of the Hebrews uses. It's the fight. I'm running, and it's a fight. And it is one that I cannot change. It has been set before us. It is a course that has been prescribed. God in his providence has laid this before us and given us this race, the one that uniquely have to run. It's the one where you have to bear your unique cross, your unique struggle, your unique challenge. You are to run it. And so what we see here in this first part of our study <clears throat> is that there's a great crowd that's cheering us on in this great race. We're running in the stadium of the saints. And if we are going to prepare properly, we need to be very conscious of the issues in our own hearts. We need to prepare well. We prepare by dealing with our sin. We need to be committed. It is a run. It is not going to be over quickly. It is a long-term commitment. And we need to have a great focus because there's a course that we have to deal with and it is going to be agonizing at times. Do you see the sobriety of what our Christian lives look like? This is all of us. This is not just the writer of the Hebrews. This is describing the Christian course. So there's great interest by a great crowd that requires preparation, commitment, and focus. But this race is encouraged to us by a great goal, by a great model, and by a great triumph is which, what we see in verse 2. Notice again, let us run with endurance. It is a distance race. It is an agony. It has been set before us. It is a course allotted by divine providence uniquely into life. And if we've prepared and we've begun to run it, what is the encouragement to complete the course? Well, first of all, verse 2, looking to Jesus. In other words, every great runner always has in his mind the goal to where he's going to get. He knows which direction, unless your name is Wrong Way Corrigan. Remember that story where he ran the wrong way thinking it's a touchdown and he scored a touchdown for the opposing team? Now, you know your goal. The original word for looking here has that idea of that song, I only have eyes for you. I look at nothing else. I'm utterly fixed on Jesus. Fifteen times in the book of Hebrews, the name of Jesus comes up. Jesus is the heart of this book. This was important for the original receivers of this letter. They were Jewish believers. They'd been cast out of the temple. They were being persecuted by their families and friends. It was hard to be a, a believer. And this is a Jewish Christian community. And they said, keep looking to Jesus. All these other things are going to pass away, but Jesus is the one who is the unique Savior. And so as you're running your race, as you begin to start, are you looking at Jesus Christ? Do you only have eyes for him? Or are you distracted by other things? They may be important, but are you keeping your eyes on Jesus as your priority? To look away from all others, turning your back upon anything else, only to look at him? That's the force of the word that's used here. Jesus is our one and only concern. Why do we do this? Why do we do it? Because of the great goal. Do you realize who he is? We look to Jesus because he's the founder and perfecter of our faith. We run this race because he's the one that created it. We're running in the footsteps of Jesus. And he's also the one who will complete it. You don't run it alone. There's a sense in which he is going to help you. Do you notice how at the end of verse 40 of chapter 11, it says that they should not be made perfect? Well, Jesus will only complete all of their redemption and salvation when he completes the entire team. He is the one that's perfecting this. In other words, as you're running this race, you are encouraged not only by looking at Jesus who started it, 
but he's the one that's helping you to make it fully all the way. I'm using a lot of hiking illustrations because it just fits so well in my mind. I can't run a race, but I hike a course. And so there's this scene that I have in my mind. It was when I was hiking a stretch of the Virginia Appalachian Trail. And I realized I had to get to a destination in time to get uh, picked up to be at the end of the trail. And I realized if I stayed on the trail, I probably wouldn't make it in time. But if I took off, I'd have to go a longer way. And, but I figured I could always hitchhike or call a taxi cab if I was on the road. And so I started walking. It just happened to be in a day when it was, got over 100 degrees. Do you know what it's like to hike? and you're about 50 miles in on a trail, and you've been carrying about a 40-pound pack, and it's 100 degrees, and you're walking along a highway, you start getting really tired and thirsty. And so I rounded the corner, and I figured on my map I had several miles to go, but I, I figured at least I kind of knew where I was. And a guy came along and stopped and said, hey, can I pick you up? There's a, a store about two miles ahead, and maybe you can get something to drink. And I thought, boy, I'd love to do that. I said, no, i got to tough it out. You know, if I'm cheating and I get a hitchhike at this early stage, I haven't done my job. So I said, no, no, I'm not going to do it. And after about a mile, I was really regretting that. I said, boy, was that stupid. I was so dumb. I thought I was going to do it all on my own. I was wielding. So tired. I said, you know what? My wife is going to say, why in the world did you decide to have a heart attack on the Appalachian Trail? Why are you so stupid? Why did you do that? That was what my history is going to be. I could, my life was passing before my eyes. And so here I'm plodding along, and I'm starting to pray, oh, Lord, you've got to get me through this. And along comes the same guy the other direction. <laughs> and now he has a, a, a two-liter ice-cold bottle of water. And he said, I thought you might just need this. <laughs> you know what we call that on the trail? That's called an angel. An angel came along just at that moment, and I was able to finish course precisely because of that provision. That's what Jesus is. He's the perfecter. He's the one that completes this race. I know it's hard. He knows it's hard. The writer of the Hebrews knows it's hard. He knows we can't make it alone, and yet we have to do our part. But somehow there's an oasis of grace that God gives at just the right hour that lifts us up and say, I can keep going because Jesus is with me. Today, that's part of what God's word is for you. That's what worship is for you. That's what fellowship is for you. It's coming together and saying, I'm not in this alone. God will perfect this through Christ. I will finish the race. And you know why? Because his reputation depends on it. Jesus, who started it, is a perfecter. He said, I will not lose one of my sheep. I call them all by name, and they come to me. I will see them in glory. I'll share my glory. I prayed for them. Not one of us will fail. God is keeping us safely. The oasis will come. Persevere. It's hard, but the Lord is here to bless you. Wait and see how his angels of mercy, his angels of grace, surprise you in the hour when you can't go another step. It's a race. It's hard. You're going up Heartbreak Hill maybe today. But the Lord says, I'm in this with you. You will finish. I will receive glory through you. This great crowd watching this great race in the great stadium of the saints requires great preparation. It requires great commitment. It requires great focus. But we're encouraged to run the race because of this great goal of Jesus who is helping us. In fact, more, he is our great model. As we look again at these words, it says, verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What we see in these words is that he too had a course set for him. It's a course that no one else could run. Have you ever seen that program about the American Ninja, those courses that people have to run and jump? I, I will never try one of those, I guarantee you. I could never make it. Jesus had a course to run that no one will ever run, far beyond anyone, and he finished it for us, he, and he endured. Can we just imagine for a moment what it meant just for a human being if we let our minds dwell on someone who had his beard plucked, his back beaten so it's red, a crown of thorns pressed upon his head, a cross of great weight that he had to carry his people, spit at him, hit at him, mocked at him. 
And then he trudged along, and it was so weighty, he fell to the ground. And all of that horrendous suffering was not even worthy of comparing of what happened when he was on the cross. We reserve a word of our suffering because of the cross, the excruciating pain, the most severe suffering that's ever been developed for anybody, an agonizing, slow, painful death. But we know that's nothing compared to the words he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We have a model. He endured far more than ever we will. And we look to Jesus not only because he helps us, but we say, Jesus, if you did all that for me, there's no burden too great for me to bear for you. I can never look at God and say, it's not fair that you did this for me. We look at one who did this so much and say, Lord, whatever you give me is nothing compared to all that you did for me. Lord, let me persevere and glorify. You are our great model. You looked at all of the suffering. You looked at your goal. You endured. You suffered. But it was for what was your goal, which was the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. And that is the destiny he reminds us of. You'll never bear my cross, but you must bear your cross. You must run this race. You must bear this burden. You will have this suffering. But remember, I've done far more for you, and I will help you through it. But when you realize the destiny, the great triumph that's ahead, you will share in my glory the joy. We see that here as he despised all that shame. He's now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He is now in the highest place of glory, the highest place of honor, Four times in the epistle to the Hebrews, it says he is seated. And the emphasis is he doesn't have to do any more of this work. He's finished the race. He said, that's what your destiny ultimately, I'm going to share this with you. Paul puts it this way. The sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Can you imagine for just a moment of what it must be like after you're enduring all the years of training as an Olympic athlete? And you finally stand on top, and you have the gold medal. Your national flag is there. The national anthem is ringing, and you have completed, and you are in the place of honor and victory. The Lord says, we're all on that championship team. This is a team sport. When the last one of us crosses the finish line, kept by grace through bearing the cross, the hard way that we must run together, all of the saints of the past will celebrate. And we all are in, this, in the joy of Jesus Christ. The joy that was set before Jesus is the joy that's set before us because we are united to Christ. We're united to him by faith. His joy becomes our joy. He's at the right hand of the throne of God, the throne of great honor, the throne of great grace. Today, there's many things that are causing you to worry. You may be worried about Climate change, but maybe if you're here earlier, you're not so worried. I hope you're not. You may be much more worried about the coronavirus. We hear lots of bad news. But you know what? That coronavirus, that coronavirus is going to be set aside for a real corona glory, a crown. Of all people that need to fear least, it's the people who know what is set before us. We have the glory of Christ. Remember how Jesus taught this in Matthew chapter 10 as he sent out his disciples to go into the world? He said, now listen, they called me Beelzebub and I'm the head of the household. Imagine what they're going to do to you. But don't be afraid. Everything that's hidden will be revealed. All their machinations will be exposed. All the promises of the kingdom we've not seen fulfilled today will come when they're all real and everyone will see it. Every eye will see him in glory. And he says, don't fear those that can kill the body. Fear the one who can kill the body and soul in hell. You know, why does he say that? <clears throat> because Jesus is in the business of giving new life to dead bodies. There's those who can harm us, and the coronavirus can harm us. And yes, those that persecute us can harm us. But don't fear them. If you suffer for Christ's sake, 
and where he, he will raise you up. You have life. Fear the one who can destroy body and soul and hell. Today, have you come to Christ and said, I need a Savior? Because there is a heaven to gain and a hell that's real. And judgment will fall. Is your soul right with God through this cross that Jesus bore? Have you come to him and said, Jesus, I need you more than anything. There's nothing that can take out the blot of my sin in my own doing. I can try to cover up, pretend, I can deny, but it's real before your x-ray vision of holiness. Jesus came to wipe out our sin and to make us pure in his sight. He says, come on to me, all of you that are tired and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. My yoke, it's a real yoke, but it's easy compared to what will happen without it. Be bold and unafraid, whatever comes. Now, be wise, of course. When we claim the providence of God, we still look both ways before we cross the road. Not foolish. But as we live our lives faithfully, do not be afraid. Today, if the coronavirus takes this old man away, then that's the way the Lord determined to take me home. I'm not going to live in fear of that. I'm going to be wise. But if the Lord says it's time to come home, and I've been praying long, Lord Jesus, come quickly. If this is the way he wants me to come to him, that's okay. I'm not going to be foolish, but I'm not going to be afraid. He says, fear not. And I mentioned this earlier, but because of all the panic and fear of climate change, well, let's talk about all the fear and panic because of the coronavirus. What does he say? Don't you know that every hair on your head is numbered? Don't you know that every day of your life was written in his book before there's one of them? Don't you know that every sparrow that falls to the ground only falls because the Father's will is being ex exercised? Don't you know that more secure is no one ever than the loved ones of the Savior? Don't you know that he's prepared a place for you that where he is, there you may be also? Don't you know as you go about your business and if the Lord should call your life, don't you know that he's going to raise you to new life? Fear not the one or the thing that can destroy the body. Fear the one that can destroy body and soul in his holy wrath. But if you know this one, if you're running this race, if you're looking to the end of the race and you see Jesus ahead, keep your eyes on him. He suffered it all for you. It's all worth it for him. And when you get there, unworthy as we are, he says, my joy is yours forever and ever. He says, the one who overcomes, I will let him seat with me. He'll have a seat with me on my Father's throne in glory. Now, some of us may be called before the race is done, but you know, we'll be part of that great crowd of witnesses cheering others on. Come on, we finished the race. You can do it. Don't give up yet. It's so wonderful. This is a tough race, but we're on a championship team. My high school football coach said, you know what? We're going to work you really hard. But, you know, it will be worth it all when we are champions at the end of the season. That's what Jesus is saying to us through the writer of the Hebrews. It's a tough slug, guys. But, you know what? When you are wearing the eternal Super Bowl ring of having one with King Jesus, our captain, our founder, our perfecter, say, praise God, it was worth every, every struggle. Let's get out there and run the race. Because Jesus is the king, and he says, you're on my team. Come on, cross the finish line, and don't be afraid. <clears throat> Just read these words again, and let them sink in. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight, and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, where you will meet him by his grace. Lord, bless your people as we now are committed once again to following after Jesus, our Lord. Would you please give us each the strength that we need? And Lord, would you use now this benediction to achieve that end? And so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We're dismissed.